Hello, my name is David Gowdy, and this is The Interview. I want you just for a moment, just to imagine. Imagine that you're a pastor, you're a minister of a thriving, growing church, and of course you're very, very busy. You have sermons to prepare, you have visitations to hospitals to make, you have members to counsel, you have programs to oversee, you have all kinds of things that are going on. Not only that, it's December. And December, of course, is one of the traditionally busiest times of the year in the Christian calendar. And so you're even extra busy in December. And as you go through the month, you're finding yourself getting tired, more tired than normal. But you think about it and you shrug your shoulders and say, well, it's a busy, busy time. It's busy in church, busy in life. And you try to put it into the back of your mind. But as the month goes on, you find that that tiredness that creeping tiredness is beginning to really weary you. You're feeling really, really tired. And come Christmas Day, you know, well, that's the last service uh, for a few days, and you can relax and enjoy uh, just a time at home with your wife and family. And, uh, but come Christmas Day, you are more than just tired. You are shattered. You're absolutely exhausted. And you breathe a sigh of relief that actually you're going to get a couple of days rest. But you make up your mind that as soon as possible after Christmas, you're going to visit your doctor. And you do that. And you walk into the doctor's surgery. And little do you know at that point, or do you know, have you any inkling at that point, that what the doctor is going to say to you is going to change your life in such a dramatic way that it will never, ever be the same again. One moment, your whole life is going to turn around and it's going to change forever. Well, that's what happened to my guest today, David McFarland. Uh, David went to the doctor and you went through the door. David, had you any idea, had you even an inkling or a suspicion that what he was about to tell you was just going to rock your world? No inclination, whatever. I, uh, over those months, as you say, had thought I'm unfit, used to skip up the stairs two at a time to the prayer meeting before the evening service and then discover I'm out of breath and I thought at first it was just lack of fitness but since my summer break in August I had just noticed that I was getting more and more tired. I was having a wheeze in my chest at night and thought I must have a chest infection and so I, I phoned the doctor uh, thought I, I need to make an appointment uh, because the new year closure of the, the surgery was coming and I thought I need to make an appointment for next week. Uh, I think the receptionist must have heard something in my breathing or something because she said do you need to see a doctor today and I said if it's possible. She said um, come in and I came in uh, surgery had really closed, my own GP stayed on, he sent his receptionist home and he said, I'll, I'll see David. Joanna thought I wasn't coming home, he kept me so long. But even after he had uh, examined me and said, you've got a little heart problem, I wasn't aware what it was. I, I said, I have two services tomorrow, he said, no you don't. I said, I've got to the Saturday morning, I have two services. And uh, he said, no, you have to go home and put your feet on and come back and see me on Monday morning. And uh, that was the beginning of the challenge of discovering that I had major heart failure. And over the weeks and, and months, I began to realize how serious it was. At first, I thought, this is great. I don't have, I don't have the, the, the pressures of work. He, he put me off for, I can't remember, two weeks or four weeks or something. And I thought, I can do some things around the house that I haven't had a chance to do for a long time. But I, I, I began to be aware that this was something much more serious. And when I began to visit the consultant and learn a little more, very gradually, I grasped the seriousness of it. They gave me some literature to read about heart conditions without saying anything really. And the little booklet had various heart illnesses and what might be necessary. 
And the last one, the last page, was about transplant. And I didn't even read that because it never entered my head that that was what they were talking about. But uh, by the time uh, May came, that was what they were talking about. They hadn't actually told me. So during all of this time from December uh, to May, you, you, were, you were no longer pastoring, you were just at home. Did you feel yourself deteriorating during that yes. time? Yes, I did. And uh, Joanna called the doctor on one occasion because I was feeling so poorly and uh, not my own GP but another doctor came out and he obviously had seen my notes and he let the cat out of the bag that I was earmarked for going to England and that was the first inclination I got hey this is much more serious than you I say thought. going to England is that going to Papworth Hospital that for me it was Papworth Hospital which is the major heart transplant hospital in the country. Yes, one, one, one of the major ones, yes, yeah. And uh, so by August, I think it was, uh, I had a, a visit there. And that was, that was traumatic because by then I was really, really weak. The whole journey there was traumatic. Getting through the airport was traumatic because of mix up in uh, communications in the airport. We almost missed getting the lift to the hospital. We, we nearly were sent back home again. And there in Papworth, they, they did run the test. Staff stayed on late. And the consultant said, yes, you are a suitable candidate for a heart transplant. Whenever they say to you that you are a suitable candidate for heart transplant, is there a window of opportunity? Do you have to be bad enough or can you be too bad or well enough or too well? Exactly. One of the things he said to us was, you have an, uh, an unnatural ability to keep going considering the condition of your heart. Uh, they talk about fractions, ejection fractions. And my heart ejection fraction was 9%. A healthy person is 45 to 55, I think. Mine was nine, which was incredibly low, but I was still able to function. I was still able to do the treadmill test much better than I ever should have. So he said, because of your tolerance, we'd like to buy you a little bit of time. Rather than put you straight on the list, we'd like to buy you a little bit of time. We'd like to, give you an experimental drug and uh, I said how long are you talking about he said uh, six months maybe a year maybe a little longer that's uh, 11 years ago last August <laughs> <laughs> and here you are still today <laughs> on the same medication that's amazing isn't it really? incredible so so at the at this moment you're not on the heart list no I never was the they called it being in the system yes. uh, and because I was in the system I would very quickly be transferred to a list but uh, different doctors have been amazed. I, I go to another consultant in uh, another area of medicine who used to work in cardiology and when I go to talk to him about my bones he wants to talk about my heart because he just cannot believe that the changes come around. Another GP said, you're a miracle. Yes. So I've got to thank God for Absolutely. what he's done for me. Absolutely. David, whatever the realisation dawned on you uh, that, that the possibility was that you would have to have a heart transplant, that must have been a scary thought, not only for you, but for your wife. And it, and it must have been quite a shock for your whole congregation because, I mean, there you are, you were pastoring for years, it was all that you have done for years, it was your passion, it was your love, and suddenly all of that stopped overnight, basically. Uh, that, that must have been a difficult period in your life emotionally to deal with all of that. It was, it was maybe not initially because for a while 
as I say, I enjoyed the, the wee break. Then as I got worse and worse, I, I knew that something was going to have to be done. Then when I knew about a heart transplant, I made some inquiries on the internet, discovered some pastors who'd had heart transplants, who'd gone back to work, talked to a Presbyterian minister here in Northern Ireland who'd had a heart transplant, who quickly was back in work. So I thought, if I get this surgery, I'll be back doing what I really want to do. It probably was a little later that the full frustration set in when I began to realise I'm not getting this immediately and maybe never will I ever get back to work. And part of me was torn by wanting to have the transplant so that I could get back to work and knowing the risks of transplant because in part of my contact with others in a similar situation to me, I'd been well aware of those who had gone through the transplant and had not survived it. So there was this tear, do I, do I go for the surgery if it's offered to me? Uh, Will I get better? Will I get well enough to get back? And even today, all these years on, I would still love to go back, but recognize physically the stresses and pressures that I used to put myself under just wouldn't work anymore. No, no, you, physically you wouldn't be up for that at all. Yes. Uh, do you have to pace yourself each day now? Yes. Uh, it's very difficult. To, to plan ahead because some days I will feel great and can do quite a lot. Other days I, I will just have to lie around and do very little. And I can't always uh, work out what sort of a day it's going to be. What about Joanna, your wife now? Obviously this was traumatic for you, but it, equally it must have been a big blow to her. Uh, and, and having to cope now with a husband who's at home every day, uh, that's, that can be a challenging change, can it? <laughs> Very much so, yes. Uh, and when people meet, met her out in the shop or wherever, they were always asking about me. And I think we forget the pressure that carers are under. And... Uh, the, the endless answering of questions. People, for the very best of reasons, want to know how the sick person is, but there is even more pressure very often on the person caring. When, when, when I was ill uh, in the early years, Joanna could barely get out of the house. She, she was under the pressure of being out to the shop I need to get back quickly in case David's unwell. It was as bad as, as that for for long periods of time. And she felt under enormous uh, strain. I suppose effectively she was your personal everyday nurse, 24-7 Very nurse. much so. Very much so. And all the things that, that I used to do uh, as, we, as we shared life together, all the things I used to do, like cutting the lawn, for example. I always cut the lawn. Joanna's had to cut the lawn now for 12 years. Carers are really the unheralded heroes, really, aren't they? Exactly. In all of this. Exactly. They do not get the recognition that they should be getting. Exactly. Now, here you are, David. Uh, you, you cannot go back to what you had the passion to do, which is pastoring. Mm. Uh, you're, I know that your church was supportive of you, but there comes a point where you, you have to lay all of that down. Mm and say, Look, I'm really not fit to do this. I, I cannot do this anymore. Uh, then do you start thinking, well, Lord, what do I do? Yes. Uh, I'm sitting here day after day. Is there something that I can do in your kingdom yes. that would be useful? Yes, uh, and, and that was very much related to my heart illness because I've always been interested in computers and web and so on. And uh, I'd researched heart transplant, heart illness on the computer and discovered hundreds of sites, advice about everything, 
But it struck me one night lying in bed, I haven't come across a website offering people going through major heart illness spiritual support. And I thought, you know, I could do that. I'd begun a website for the church back in 1999. I'm just a, an amateur. I, and uh, I still look after that, but I knew enough to at least put something together. So I bought a domain name and became known as Two Hearts, the number two. Two Hearts, and uh, began a little website. Excuse me, what, why Two Hearts? Why Two Hearts? Mm. How did you come up with that? Because, because at that time I thought I was going to have a second yes. heart. Yes. Okay. And it linked in with the spiritual yeah. heart, yeah. Uh, physical and spiritual. So the, the uh, little website got started and very quickly I found two families in America who had found it and wanted spiritual support. Neither of them Christian families, but both with little boys who had just had heart transplants, one a year before, but who was extremely ill, back in hospital again, and not expected to live. And I said uh, I would pray for him. And they allowed me to put a, a little picture of him and some information about him on my Two Hearts website. That little boy got home for Christmas <laughs> and today is a bouncing Isn't that healthy wonderful? boy. Uh, the other one did very well. Later, uh, he died uh, through complications with uh, the medication which can cause cancer. Yeah. Uh, but I still keep in touch with that family as well. And over a, a short period of time, I, I, God brought a lot of folk along, some of them Christian, and I was able to share their testimony online which in turn helped other people and so today I, I ministered in one way or another to about 70 families some with almost no contact others with quite a bit of contact. That's amazing David that, that so many people that, that it's almost like a congregation there you reach out to in a way. It is. So the internet's a wonderful vehicle for reaching people. Yes. I know there can be a lot of abuses, but it can do so much good exactly. to reach into people's lives that you'd never ever meet or never get a chance to visit. All over the world. All over the world. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you a, a lovely little story. I looked one day on a French heart website. It's, it's in French and English. And a Romanian lady had said, my little niece is a year old, has a major heart illness that cannot be uh, operated on in Romania. Is there anybody out there who can help us? And uh, I responded on the forum saying, I, I would like to pray for her. Her name was Lucia. And it seemed the Lord said to me, as I prayed for her, is there nothing more you can do? And I thought, maybe, just maybe I should try. And I wrote to a, a very famous heart surgeon in England, one that wasn't involved with me. I wrote to him and said, look, is there anything could be done for her in England? And he asked me to get her notes. I got her notes sent to him. He said, sadly, I cannot help, but I have colleagues in Italy who might be able to. I heard nothing more for a couple of months. And then the family in Romania got in touch. They said, we've got an invitation to go to Italy for surgery. As it turned out, the Italian surgeons did surgery free of charge. A little Romanian girl got a message put on a French website. An Irishman <laughs> heard it. He wrote to an Englishman who happened to be Egyptian. And he wrote to Italians, and the Italians <laughs> did the service. It's not wonderful. A, a wonderful story, and I keep in touch with that family. Oh, She's great. been back to Italy for a second heart that's surgery. Great. She's now, I think, eleven years old. David, that is just wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, and story. how satisfying that must be to you, and and how gratifying that here you are with all of your illness and and having to lay down your passion. And then suddenly you're finding a whole new ministry, really. Yes. And reaching yes. out around the world to people that you'd never hoped to meet. Yeah. And suddenly this that young girl is so touched by this. It's, yeah. it's just wonderful. Yeah. Mm. 
So, what about the future then? Uh, obviously, now that that was eleven years ago, when you got that news, when you walked into the doctor's surgery, sure. uh, probably none of them expected you to be here uh, without a heart transplant in yes. eleven years' time. But yeah. here you are, looking tremendous, busy again, mm. but in a way that you can handle. Yes, uh, and and not only that, but you're a bit of an author too. Uh, you, you you like to to do the old scribing, don't you as well? I I do a, I do a little bit. I since I came to Moira, I I had a little bit of an interest in finding out the history of this place, and when I had more time and felt a little better in my years of illness, I began to research a little bit more. And I've spoken occasionally around Moira to groups who wanted to know about the history of Moira. Uh, I still go in once a year into the primary school and teach the P4s about the history of Moira. And uh, as I discovered uh, more about the history, I thought I can use even the history of Moira to help present the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not interested in history just for history's sake. I wanted to use it in some way for the Lord. And some friends encouraged me to write and produced a little book that has the history of Moira in, in story form. This is the little book here, isn't it? That's the little book. We produced 3,000 copies of that. And uh, one of those was, was offered free to every home in Moira, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Yes, Footprints Over Moira. And I've, I've read this book, you gave me a copy of this book when it came out, and it's a, it's a great read, so it is. Mm. It's beautifully written, and it's uh, wonderfully illustrated. And I discovered lots of things in it that I didn't know, and I've been here in quite a number of years. And uh, it's really well produced and put together. And not only that, but you did a little uh, DVD called Under the Trees, and again, it's a little more pictorial uh, study of the history of Moira. Moira has a long history, it's like over a thousand years or something like that, yes. isn't it? Yes. And uh, and so that this is also available. And uh, you've also written a little uh, track like pamphlet, uh, How Is Your Heart? And uh, again, it's beautifully produced. That's uh, a, that's a, a using of the two hearts, yes. my physical heart and my spiritual heart. Yes. And uh, it, it was used to get a message across. And occasionally I've, I've done services in churches where we've talked about heart illness and, and, and so on. And then uh, in, a, in an interview, a bit like this, folk have, have asked questions about how you need a new heart physically and spiritually. Well, I think that you've got the experience and, and you're not speaking in a vacuum. It's not just head knowledge. You've been through this. Yes. And, uh, and, and God's grace has been wonderful, David. Uh, he's helped you so many yeah. ways during all this period. If it wasn't for, for the grace of God, A, in saving me, mm -hmm. I have to acknowledge the goodness of God in, in so Absolutely. many ways. Here, here I am, saved by his grace yeah. and it's by the grace of God that I'm able to do what I do. Yeah. In fact, sometimes I call suffering the, the grace of suffering. Mm -hmm. I desperately wish I could go back 11, 12 years. I desperately wish I could go back and do all the things yeah. I used to do. And to be honest, many days it's hard. Yeah. Um, the Two Hearts Ministry has been good. All the other things I do to help missionary societies with their websites and uh, many little things that I do sure. help me, but I would desperately love to go back and be a pastor again. Yeah, absolutely. But the grace of, uh, of suffering has taught me so much mm -hmm. and I long that the Lord might use Sure. suffering that I've gone through, which is very minor compared to many other people, but I long that God would use the suffering that I've gone through to help and encourage people Absolutely. who are who are struggling sure. with their suffering. You may be one of the ones today watching that are struggling, and perhaps you have been in a position, maybe not exactly the same as David, 
but maybe you have had one of those bolts out of the blue situations uh, where you've taken such a, a blow to your whole life, maybe, maybe a sudden bereavement, maybe, maybe a child has died suddenly, maybe a marriage has gone bust or a business has fallen apart and suddenly you find yourself not able to do what you used to do and not be in the position that you used to be and how do you handle all of that? Well, David here has told us today his story. What, a, what an inspiring, amazing story of the grace of God and how that he felt maybe for a while that his life was virtually over. But we have seen and heard today how that it wasn't over. In fact, God had something new and different for him to do uh, during this long period and, and the lives that he's touched already. Uh, I, I really appreciate you, David, coming uh, by today and telling us your story. Uh, you. I have no doubt that people watching will be inspired and encouraged by it. Thank uh, you. And I think maybe particularly there's some people that have just said who's just been dealt a terrible blow in life and they're wondering how they're going to cope and how they're going to get through. Well, watch and listen and see the grace of God in people's lives. And then why don't you, and I encourage you to do this, if you're in that situation, why don't you just say, oh God, please help me today. I don't know what to do. I don't know what my future is, but I need your help and I need your grace. And if you ask God to help you, he will help you. He loves you. He cares about you. He sent his son to die for you. He could not show his love any better than that. And so why don't you pray that little prayer today and ask God to come and help you. And I believe and I trust that he will do that. If you would like uh, this little book, Footprints Over Moira, it's free. Uh, and you can receive this from David, but don't write to us. We want you to write to him. Uh, in a moment or two, his web address will come up on the screen and you can contact him via that personally. And you can view and browse on his website and hear some of those stories. And also, there's a f just a few of these little DVDs left also. Uh, no doubt he would be happy to give you one of those or one of these little pamphlets high as your heart. And so we appreciate you watching this today and we hope and trust that you have been encouraged through it. And may God bless you. Thank you.